five. Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It is uh, Wednesday afternoon, January 5th at 3 p.m. We are going to spar start uh, our discussion today with some introductions. Uh, yesterday, for those of you who were not here, we spent the time hearing from those on the ground, understanding what's happening in our schools as best we possibly can. Uh, and then after today, uh, after today's introductions, we'll spend the remaining uh, time talking about committee priorities and general response to yesterday's discussion so we can start to organize our schedules. Uh, I did, at the recommendation of Senator Lyons and Senator Hooker, uh, invite the agency uh, Department of Health in tomorrow to talk to us about how they are communicating with the Agency of Education uh, and in turn schools, superintendents, etc. Uh, tomorrow afternoon we'll also be, ha we'll have a joint hearing with the joint presentation with finance on the waiting study. If you haven't had an opportunity to review it, uh, please do so before tomorrow afternoon. And then on Friday we are scheduled to bring us back to the issues of church and state before us. And that's a kind of an overview of this week. Uh, and uh, that may change slightly depending on our afternoon discussions around priorities. But before we get to our priorities, we have uh, a couple of uh, new faces with us. Uh, and let's start with Daphne. Daphne um, is our new committee assistant. Welcome, Daphne. Uh, we thought maybe if you'd be willing just to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you landed here with us uh, and uh, what you're looking forward to this session. Of course. Um, welcome and hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be working with your committee. And thank you for inviting me to introduce myself. Um, I grew up in Southern Vermont and so I've lived in Vermont most of my life. I'm particularly interested in working with Senate education just because I have a background working in education, both early childhood and um, and in after school programs and uh, most recently for the last five years in higher education. Um, so thrilled to work with you and uh, get this perspective on what's happening in education in Vermont. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And, uh we'll introduce ourselves uh, in just a bit, but if um, anybody has any immediate questions for Daphne. Okay, great. And we, uh, for the record, we, we had a wonderful committee assistant last year um, and uh, certainly we'll miss her, uh, but I know that she is going to do um, great things for the transportation committee where I believe she has landed. Uh, which uh, is terrific. Okay, uh, Beth St. James, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Do you want me to give the same kind of brief background? Sure, that would, be, that would be great. You, uh, as much as you would like to, to tell sure. us in your sure. comfortable so, Thank you. Uh, Chair Campion. Uh, Beth St. James, I'm one of the newest attorneys at the Office uh, of Legislative Counsel. I started at the very end of October. Um, Jim and I will be doing education uh, issues together this session. Um, we don't necessarily, and Jim, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but we don't necessarily have an, an equal division of who's doing exactly what. So you will likely see both of us um, often. Um, I've met some of you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am very excited to be working with the education committees. I um, am sorry to disappoint. I've disappointed many legislators so far. I am not a native New England, or I'm sorry, I'm not a native Vermonter, but I am from New England. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I actually went to law school out on the West Coast. I uh, got to experience uh, the West Coast for a little while, and I'm very grateful to be back um, where there are seasons. Um, I worked for the Attorney General's Office in Oregon for a few years doing child welfare matters. Um, and uh, in uh, Vermont, I worked very briefly at Legal Aid when I first got um, back to New England. And then I was at the Secretary of State's Office in the Office of Professional Regulation as their Chief Prosecutor um, for about seven years. 
So I do not have a background in education law, um, but I am uh, very excited to jump in. Uh, Jim has been giving me lots of background to, to get me up to speed. I'm slowly finding my sea legs, um, but I'm very, very excited to work with uh, this committee um, and on this uh, subject area. That's great. And I'll tell you right now, one, if perhaps the best attorney in Ledge Council also arrived here without any background in education law, and that's Jim Demaret. So uh, Jim, welcome back. We're thrilled to see you. Uh, uh, and uh, is there anything you'd like us to know that we don't may not know? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. It's great to see you all. Um, we don't know. Did you know that I worked in oil fields and fishing boats when I was 19 and 20? We say that again. We're in the oil fields? Oil fields and fishing boats. Oh, really? Yep. I Pretty didn't good. know that. Where, know whereabouts? That. Uh, Wyoming, oil fields, uh -huh. Cape May, New Jersey for scallop boats. Really? Yep. That's great. That's great. No, I didn't know that. Who's uh, actually the manual labor as well as intellectual labor. Yeah. So where, did you say uh, scallop boats in Maine? Uh, where no, in um, Cape May, New Jersey. Oh, Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. Okay. Great. Terrific. Small factory. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Uh, well, I, I know I speak for everyone that we're really excited to have the three of you with us. Um, does anyone have any questions for uh, Beth or Jim or Daphne at this point before we introduce ourselves? No questions about GPAs or nothing. Okay, we're <laughs> going to let those things go since. Okay, uh, let's let's go around then uh, and introduce ourselves. Uh, Senator Hooker, you're at the the top of the screen here. Uh, Thanks. Start. Thanks, Senator Campion, Cheryl Hooker from Rutland. Uh, I serve as vice chair of this committee. I'm also on health and welfare with two of the other members of this committee. So it's kind of good to spend the whole day with them, uh, hoping to uh, see us through this really difficult time, especially for schools. But I know that we can help to uh, make it easier on our teachers and administrators in what we do in these committees. So happy to be here. Have you, Senator Lyons? Uh, thank you, Chair Campion, and uh, it, it's it's great to meet you, Beth and Jim. Welcome back. I look forward to working with you and Daphne. We met yesterday, but I know that she's already proven herself terrific. <laughs> uh, so I am. I chair the Health and Welfare Committee. I'm. Uh, just really pleased to be working on this committee. My, I am a professor of biology, uh, my background, and I have a very eclectic background. So I enjoy working in environmental areas as well as healthcare areas. And where those things meet, it's called public health. So, and we see that a lot in this committee. So it's gonna be, it's, it's fun. And I'll just share with Beth that uh, I can't remember when it was, but when Katie McClinn first came on to Ledge Council, she was the Ledge Council for Education and I happened to be vice chair at that point. So uh, who knows, you may end up in healthcare. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I really enjoy uh, working to make the lives of children better. And I know that happens with parents uh, and families, but more importantly in this committee with teachers and administrators who understand the challenges of growing up. Terrific. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Senator Lance. Senator Terenzini. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, Senator Josh Terenzini from Rutland County. Um, this is the second half of my first uh, term, and I'm excited to be back. Um, education is something that's certainly near and dear to my heart, my family's heart. We have uh, 
three of our four little children are in elementary school now. So we very much care about what happens to all children uh, in Vermont from pre-K to high school and beyond. So excited to be back with this group of talented legislators and uh, exceptional legal minds. And uh, I look forward to uh, a, a good few months here. Great. Great to see you again. Senator Chittenden. I am Tom Chittenden, representing Chittenden County Senate District. I am a new senator as well, so I'm uh, one year into my first term in this uh, work. I'm on Senate Transportation uh, with Senator Perchlick and also on Senate Education. Um, I have a, I'm a senior lecturer. That's my full-time job at the University of Vermont. I uh, have a very technical background. I also used to do consulting in IT. So I have about 15 technical certifications, but uh, a lot of those have gone stale as I focus more of my free time on public service, which is why I'm here today. Uh, so uh, at UVM, I have had different hats over the years. I'm also a father of three public school age, uh, public school, school age kids. And I'm also married to a lovely public school teacher. And she gives me a lot of advice for this. this podcast. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. Great to see you. Senator Perslick who's a non-voting member, but he is allowed to come to committee. Um, go ahead, Senator Persley. Thank you, Campion, for change, well, you know, give, suspending the rules and letting me speak. <laughs> this is my, I'm Andy Perslick, a Senator of Washington County, the 18 towns and two cities of Washington County. This is my fourth year, so the end of my second term in the Senate. Uh, I lived in Montpelier when I got elected, but I've, I've moved back to Marshfield. I mean, I've lived in Orange County and I've lived in Rutland County in the times that I've been in Vermont. But like Beth, I'm not a native Vermonter. I grew up in Colorado and moved here in 1995 to get married to my wife, who is an early education teacher, teaches kindergarten, preschool. Uh, I'm the vice chair of transportation. In my background, you know, when I'm not in the legislature, I do energy policy. I work for the state. I work for the Department of Public Service, Clean Energy Development Fund, doing renewable energy policy and development programs. Great. Thank you. Great to see you. Great to have you back. Likewise. And uh, I'm Brian Campion, uh, chair of this committee, and I serve on natural resource and energy. Uh, I was the vice chair there for a few years, but I was stripped of that last year uh, when I became chair of this committee. So I just was a regular member. Uh, I also am involved, I work at Bennington College. Uh, I oversee public policy programs at the Center for the Advancement of Public Action there in a similar role uh, titled to Senator Chittenden, uh, not professor, but uh, lecturer and have done some, some work there uh, in the classroom over the past uh, 15 years. And that's it. Um, great again to have all of you with us. Uh, do you have any questions for us at this point? Okay, great. So uh, as you know, uh, we're gonna move into now uh, committee priorities. Please feel free to join us if you'd like, either uh, stick around visually or if you, you want to uh, just have your name or image up there, that's fine as well, uh, and just listen in. Uh, and uh, we'll leave it there for now. But again, welcome, and please feel free to reach out to any, any of us if you have any questions or concerns as you get settled and, and moving forward this year. It's a great committee. Um, it's great having people from, uh, so many people from health and welfare on here. We also have two members, as you know, from transportation, which is great. Um, and it really is a, a smart, dedicated group of people, and we're glad to have you all join us. So thank you. Okay. Committee, I thought we might spend the next uh, 30, 40 minutes just going through and talking about some of our priorities, reflecting a little bit on uh, what we heard yesterday, as well as what we just heard from the governor, uh, and then just generally where people are at with other, with bills that they might be putting in or areas of focus that um, they would like to focus on. I think, um, two things that I know I, I wrote to everyone about uh, that will be coming to us in one way or the other. Uh, and there's still some conversations with leadership around timing. That is the waiting study, which uh, as I mentioned, will kick off tomorrow uh, with a joint 
uh, presentation with finance. And again, if you haven't had an opportunity, it's a great report. Um, and uh, if you have time to review it this evening, uh, I'd appreciate it. And then the other issue that we are still uh, is on the forefront for us, I think, is looking at these issues of church and state. There are a number of different court cases uh, we know before the Supreme Court, other court cases that this state is involved in. So we need to uh, review this. I've asked uh, Jim Demaray and Beth St. James to bring us back to that moment where we left it last year. I've done some work over the summer, which I'll share with everyone. So those are, are two things out there that will take up some time. That being said, uh, we will make our way through those and we'll have certainly time for uh, other issues, other priorities. So with that, if, if everyone's comfortable, we'll just go in the same order. Uh, Senator Hooker, are, are you comfortable just kicking us off and then we'll go Senator Lyons, Senator Terenzini, Senator Chittenden, Senator Pershler? Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, the waiting study, I, I had some contact with that over yep. the summer and fall, and I'm looking forward to continuing that discussion. Um, also, I have a, a bill that I've introduced on governance for the Vermont State College System and UVM, looking at adjusting the members of those boards. So I'm hoping that we can take a look at that. People have been um, asking about that possibility. Um, what we heard yesterday about what's going on in schools now with communications, and you alluded to this, Senator Campion, and Senator Lyons had suggested that we talk to uh, health, the Department of Health about their communicating with schools with regard to COVID and the, the incredible um, time frame, really, that happens. I spoke with one father who said his kids are... Uh, expected to be in school at eight o'clock and he got a call at quarter of eight telling him that you know it wasn't going to happen that day so uh, they need to families need to know what's going on teachers need to know kids need to know so i'm hoping that we can um, talk to the health department about that and i'm sure i'm missing something else but all of you will fill it in great so uh would you mind just saying one uh, quick sentence about uh, the governance uh, as it relates to the state colleges? Yeah, so um, actually, I, I think that the crux of it is to have more uh, involvement from faculty and staff. And in the governance of the institution. And the governance of the institutions, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Senator Lyons. That sounds good. I, as a as a college professor, I'm I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, although I ended up doing a lot of administration, so uh, anyway, um, the so th yes, the waiting study is important, and uh, obviously there's uh, there are some differences across the state, so it'll be interesting to see how we can resolve um, the different those differences. Um, you know, I think that we're confronted right now with a such a large mental health problem with our kids that maybe we can think about um, ways of linking mental health services with schools. Now, schools can't do it. The the behavioral difficulties that teachers and school nurses are facing actually are a step beyond their ability. Uh, so uh, this is a this is difficult because it leads into the question of having workforce. And uh, so we I think we just need but I think we need to talk about what are the possibilities. And uh, there was a, we did have a conversation with the large Franklin Northwest whole set of districts about this a couple of weeks ago and i so we might we could invite maybe uh the leadership of that group um lynn coda to come in and talk a little bit about that i know essex high school has done a great deal with that i i'm i'm thinking and and also uh, you know the other districts that lynn coda might represent 
Champlain Valley, Essex, Essex Westford, South Burlington, uh, Franklin Northwest. So he's the uh, 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 superintendent. That whole superintendent group, right? Yeah, Lynn is the superintendent in the Franklin Northwest. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then, so the mental health issue is is critically important. That links in a little bit with some of the work we did on the Child Protection Oversight Committee, and uh, this committee and other committees will be getting the report. It's a simple letter from that committee on uh, going back to the Kern Hatton issue. And what can we do to ensure that when kids are in residential facilities that we have some oversight? And by that, I mean some state oversight, whether it's through DCF, AOE, or both. And I'm an advocate for, the, for education having a role to play in this. So that's another, that's another issue. Um, and then overall, the the whole the challenges that we face with cultural differences within our schools, um, especially now in the pandemic. I don't know, maybe just looking at where we are with our community school initiative would yeah. be helpful. Yeah. So, and and I'm I'm with you on the Department of Health and how we can have that communication taking place more effectively. And then I just sent you that little bill. Maybe there's something else we can talk about in terms of helping teachers reach the next step in their graduate programs or other uh, endeavors. So by, by just by looking at the workshops or the CEUs that they have and linking those with uh, credit, higher uh, ed think, credit. I think it's a great idea. I really do. And I think you're, you're right about as much as we can, even our, our district also mentioned trauma is such a big issue. Um, yeah. And it's being, of course, um, yeah. becoming more serious given everything that's going on. And, and so, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. It sounds to me, Senator Lyons, correct me if I'm wrong, but you believe uh, Franklin Northwest and Essex both do a good job of having the sort of mental health supports in the schools, these two superintendents? I think they're very aware of okay. what they need. And I know Essex has done a okay. lot in the past, but yep. the pandemic has just changed the landscape. Yep. Okay. It's really helpful. Um, and then, yes, we will get a, a, a report on community schools as well as uh, I will send everyone a list. We, there were many reports that were requested last year. I believe only two have been, uh, the due dates for two have passed uh, mid-December. Mid Everything else starts, starts rolling in mid-January, um, but we'll review those reports and I'll get those to you and have an opportunity for questions and answers in committee as well. Um, and thanks again, Senator Lyons, for uh, flagging the need to have Department of Health in tomorrow to talk to us about how they are communicating with, with the schools and see if there's something we can do to be helpful. Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator. I was going to say, it's, it's great having two senators. I think uh, I think Senator Pertzlick's children are both in, all in college now, but um, people who have actual kids in school that are experiencing this firsthand. Senator Terenzini, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. I, I uh, concur with um, Senator Hooker and Lyons on a lot of the things that they mentioned. Um, I, I didn't necessarily need to hear yesterday's presentation from the Department of Ed and the superintendents and so on to know that our schools are in crisis, but it was good to hear it. Um, not, that, not that I wanted to hear bad news, but it, it just reinforced mine and my wife's belief that, you know, we we think we have a great school system, uh, and I know that our kids are blessed to go to, to, to the Rutland Town School, for example, but every school in this in the state, in this country right now, is just in, in crisis mode due to this virus, and, and who would have ever thought that we would be at a place where we're at today? A year ago, we were all excited that the vaccines were, were going to be deployed, right? And we were hoping we were going to be on the back side of this. So, um, so a number of things that, you know, I'm still interested in discussing more. 
Um, but I also heard loud and clear yesterday from all of those leaders that they really don't want more imp uh, implementation right now. They're just sort of in a, in a holding pattern to sort of mitigate the virus and get through the next year or whatever. But I, I still think there's some, um, there's some interest on my part to talk about the dyslexia, screening for dyslexia a little bit more. I don't think we ever put any finality to that. Um, I know that early on last year, uh, Senator um, McCormick had introduced the civics bill, which, you know, I know that we sort of tossed around somewhat and I don't know what we, I don't remember what exactly we figured with that, but that might be worth talking about. But once again, I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to um, make the lives of the educators and administrators tougher because of the agenda that I might have or this committee might have, if that makes sense. I want to help and be a good partner to these administrators and superintendents as they they're in the trenches right now. So yeah. I want to do what I can. I want to do what we can as a committee to help help support them, not put more work on their plates right now. So those were a couple of my thoughts. So I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I too have heard from some constituents about the dyslexia piece and had a meeting with Secretary French. So I, I do think we need to review that. I, I do have some ideas. You know, I, I feel as though we we may have, and I could be wrong, we'll have a conversation. I'll put it on the agenda around civic ed. Um, some different, some interesting things are happening out there statewide, and I'll, I'll try to bring some voices into the committee about that. And I just was wondering, Senator Terrence, if you'd say something about your Holocaust bill uh, that came to our committee uh, yesterday. And to me, yeah. it's um, it, it's an important bill. And if you're comfortable, it, it might be a vehicle for uh, not only that issue, but perhaps others. So if you would just want to say something about that. Yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, re reminding me. I'm, I'm sorry yeah, sure. to mention. There's a lack of, uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we had been approached, um, uh, some of us the legislators have been approached earlier in the year or last summer um, from a UVM student, actually, um, who asked uh, some of us to introduce a bill uh, that was similar to this Holocaust bill. And, and after meeting with her and her family, um, it was really um, surprising to me that we aren't teaching, not, I don't want to make generic terms, but some, some school districts aren't prioritizing and teaching on, um, the Holocaust, uh, and the genocide that took place, uh, and World War II as a whole. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I truly believe that it's lessons, uh, that we can take from the Holocaust that we need to teach the next generation as to how the, the world went horribly wrong 80 years ago and how we want to make sure that that never something like that never happens ever again. Uh, and, and we're going to get there through love and tolerance and respect of differences. And so it's really important um, that we discuss it. I know that uh, representative Peter Fagan of Rutland city introduced a, a companion bill to it in the uh, house. So I would assume at some point the house education committee would be discussing it. Uh, but I appreciate you mentioning it and I hope we have some time to take some testimony on it uh, down the road here. Yeah, you bet. I, um, there are some, also some interesting things, important things happening out there throughout the country. I, I know um, in Brookline, Massachusetts, a curriculum has been developed and Brandeis has been involved over the years with, with uh, different curricular initiatives that hopefully we can also bring into the committee and have conversations about related to that. So, so thank you. Thank you. Senator, Senator Chinden. So similar to Senator Terenzini, I too am cautious to try to bring forward legislation that would impact or uh, weigh on our school district. So I wouldn't frame these as priorities, but things on my radar that I think to, would be worth additional attention from this committee. Uh, I'm just before I let make my list, I want to also add, I have a lot of firsthand experience with faculty governance and higher education. I've had a lot of different hats and been in the UVM Faculty Senate for 10 years prior to this. So I look forward to that discussion and I, I have some firsthand experience to weigh in on that. But the five things that I had jotted down here, um, I remember last session last year, uh, at one point, an administration official brought forward the notion of standardizing the academic calendar across the state. I, I hear loud and clear, they don't want us to make any broad changes like that this session, but I, I never saw that picked up again. And um, I see that as something worth considering on the, the longer term horizon uh, to understand what the benefits might be uh, to having some consistency across the state or at least some parameters. Uh, that's from my firsthand experience with kids and a teacher that works in a different school district and also just talking with teachers. And from my UVM experience, I have a lot of experience with uh, 
academic calendars. Uh, the other one that I would also love to hear attention and have this committee here, um, it's a topic that I think ties into the childcare discussion. Uh, it's the kindergarten entrance age. I also have some firsthand experience with this and a lot of testimony, anecdotal evidence and experiences from Vermonters. But Vermont is one of the handful of the 50 states that allows local education agencies to choose the a kindergarten entrance age in the public school to be some date between August 31st and December 31st. What that does is if you look at the math of a child from zero to five years old, and it's actually creating up to a 7.3% increase in childcare demand uh, when if every municipality, every school district actually uh, required or, or set the date to be August 31st. Uh, that pushes kids into the, uh, to the overloaded, unavailable childcare system. We are not by any means the standard. We are an exception uh, or less common to, or less comparable to the rest of the nation. I understand from a conversation with Secretary French that uh, previous efforts have brought this topic up. They've discussed it. It's been considered. I, I think it's worth our attention again as we look at the new landscape of childcare challenges and just understanding what the benefits might be. In my county, a, a family in Williston can enter, enroll their kid uh, that was born up until December 31st, but across this imaginary boundary drawn 150 years ago in Essex, they have to be four months older uh, and that, that that date is set to August 31st. That's because of current Vermont state statute. And Jim Demeray has uh, very helpfully done some, uh, given me some background on this, but I think it's worth our attention. I'm not saying we need to shake the earth with this, but if we wanna look at a one way to decrease the demands on childcare while also giving more parents agency in the placement of their children in the public school system, I think it's worth our attention. The three other things are things that you've heard of. Um, as I was reading the pupil waiting study report, which again, I applaud the committee. You did excellent work and I really appreciate the report that I've been re now reading for the second time. But there is one piece in there that um, I really wonder if we can connect it more broadly to the discussion last session regarding universal school lunches which has to do with the universal income declaration form. So I personally would like to better understand why we haven't been doing that across the board, what the implications would be to, to just make sure that moves forward and to make sure it moves forward in a way that can be used to also achieve that getting the cash register out of the cafeteria in a way to fund universal food, healthy food available to our kids in an income sensitive manner. So I, I'm intrigued to learn more about that. Two other quick things really uh, yesterday in the testimony, uh, the VPA retirement retiree bill that's been out there for a while to have us have a deeper bench to bring in talented individuals to support our schools. I'd love to know more about that and see if we can push it forward. And then the last one, extending the expulsion standards to private schools. I was a little taken aback that we uh, that our language didn't actually include that. Thanks for the time. Yeah, no, that's, that's all terrific. Thank you for all that. Um, uh, yeah, so the VPA bill, uh, Kate agreed to start that in the house. Um, and so they hopefully will get it to us in the next couple of weeks. I think they're jumping into it right now. Uh, and if for some reason they don't get it over to us, we'll find a vehicle, but I appreciate you raising it. Uh, I know that there are a number of uh, teachers who are, um, uh, you know, in, <clears throat> retired teachers who are in this, this sort of situation. They, they, they wanna be back in the classroom but um, their retirement uh, pensions uh, are limiting the time that they can be back there. So I too was surprised we didn't put uh, suspensions and expulsions. They don't apply to private schools. I, I, I mentioned that to somebody also recently. I, um, I apologize for that oversight on my part. I don't, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and I'm not sure why, why we did it that way. And then finally, um, if you are willing, would you work with Jim Demeray to get some language uh, done just around the kindergarten situation? Uh, because we'll probably have a vehicle for that. And if we have some language, even if it's you know it's not an, a bill that's entered, we can I'm sure we can find a vehicle, uh, do some kind of committee miscellaneous bill. Um, so that would be great, and that would help keep us focused. And once you have it, just send it around to us so we can review it. And I agree, you know, with everybody, what everybody said around first and foremost, what are we doing to support the teachers and school personnel and children and families in the classroom? So, uh, Senator Perslick. You want just my top 45? Yeah, yeah, if you just top 45 would be great. Now we're not gonna be online when you read them, but um, <laughs> we are listening. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is not in any order, just the order that I wrote them down. The bill is being introduced today. I don't know if it'll come to our committee or 
finance, it's to switch our education funding system to an income system more completely. We already have income eligibility, but this would make it uh, all homestead instead of paying the property tax would be an income tax. We'd still have property tax for commercial and, and non homestead property. It was something that the task force, the waiting people task force recommended. It's one of the yeah. recommendations you'll see in the report. And so three of the members of that task force are gonna be sponsors plus some other folks. So uh, it's, it's a big deal, but it's not a big deal that I think would have a lot of impact on the schools. In fact, I think it would help relieve a lot of local pressure on schools that get um, a lot of school boards have to defend their budgets on how much it'll change the taxes of people on their property tax, even if they don't have, you know, retired folks, folks that don't have a changing of income, but their property values go up and down. So I think it could, could be helpful as uh, how education is funding discussions are held on the local level. Uh, another one is whatever other folks talked about the waiting study for sure, how we're, how we're going to deal with the equity question. And I want to make sure that we do tie in Act 173 to that. And if, if for some reason we can't figure out how to change the weights or change the way we're going to equitably, uh, you know, pay for, for students, then I think we should consider another uh, delay of Act 173. Uh, S-162 is a bill I introduced, and this is about allowing teachers, after they've given their letter saying, yes, I'm going to teach next year, to give them some time that they can apply for an, another teaching job in the state. Because right now, if you're a teacher and you send in your letter on like April 15th or whatever day it is, if the next day you find out there's an a opening in your local school where you happen to live, you can't apply for that job unless you get the superintendent's permission, which I understand. And I think maybe there were some comments made yesterday di directed to opposing this bill in that it, we what we don't want to have happen is, you know, schools that can pay a lot more just uh, stealing, so to speak, all the good teachers from, from other districts. But at the same time, as we're trying to draw people to the profession and allow those that are good to, to go get the jobs that they want. I think that's something we can do. There, I think there'd be a way to, to be compromised on, on this issue. So I think we can at least discuss it. I think the issue you brought up, Chair, often the church and state issue, I think is important that we should address. There, there's work that we've done all three years that I've been on the committee prior around the education board and agency of education and what they're doing. Even though I've been on the committee for three years, I still don't really understand, you know, what the Board of Education does versus the agency sometimes. And I think clarifying that uh, would be helpful. And for example, on this, the issue that came up yesterday about getting the license through peer review, I thought that was something done by the AOE, but maybe, it, maybe I was mis misunderstanding on how that program's run. And I thought we kind of were getting to a place where there was some agreement on way to, how to divide those, those, the roles of those two entities up and make it clear. So it could be something that we could work on. The school infrastructure work that we did last year, I think is something that we could do that would help out schools a lot. You know, we haven't had aid to construction in schools for, for many years. I thought what we did last year was a good first step, but that's going to we're just going to get the reports back. And so we, yeah. the next step is going to be critical, I think. Other two things that I care a lot about that I hope this committee can do is the universal after school, something I agree strongly with the governor. The governor mentioned it again today. Uh, you know, we now as cannabis is going to start to be sold, there was talk and, and not only talk, but legislation about some of the money going to help make after school universal. So I hope we can follow through on that. And then just childcare in general, how we're gonna support childcare centers and childcare in general, you know, whether it be through something I hadn't heard about this issue of the of the start date. Although I didn't I did know that different schools have different start dates, and sometimes people change schools just so they can, can uh, meet an earlier date to get their kids in into preschool or first grade. 
Um, but childcare in general is something that I'm interested in. I know a lot of that happens in, in our Alliance Committee, but where we can work together with her committee, I think it would be, it would be great work. Yeah, I'll send you the other 10 pages uh, later for you to read tonight. Great, thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, I, I know Center Alliance has been a leader on the early childhood front, um, and I suspect that will continue to come out of her committee, and I suspect Center Alliance can speak to it better than I. I'm sure everyone in health and welfare is eager to see if Build Back Better or if this uh, recent uh, federal bill gets passed um, to, to see how much that might help us, so. You know, and a, and a comment uh, about childcare generally and, and making changes that a lot of what we did in our bill last year, H-171, was to set a, a pathway. So we're, we're not going to see data and information until the end of 2022, 23, and without Build Back Better, it's going to be a significant challenge to do any of, uh, meet any of the goals that we have set. Uh, so this Friday, we are looking at the financing, where the financing is right now and the changes that are being made through the IT system. So we'll be looking at that in our committee. And if we learn something exciting, we'll keep you posted. Great. Uh, but that after school program is, you know, so many people, I, I, it, we shouldn't take it away from education at all, but the fact of the matter is the after school program is a family centered program. And so it's, it's more about community than it is about school. But then we say, well, no, schools are our community. Um, and it is such a key program for prevention. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so awesome. It we is. And I do appreciate it appreciate your work on this interpersonal and I, I think it's um yeah it's crucial I'm, I'm really up I'm hoping we can get there also um to you know, having giving children that opportunity after school and it's a huge equity issue we know as well to you know, what a upper middle class family compared to a lower middle class family can offer their children for after school experiences and plays into so many different things uh, and the opportunity to learn more is is huge so i appreciate it very much um so this is senator person did you have anything else at this point no okay so uh this is very helpful uh i uh as you know put together a, a skeletal uh skeleton skeletal agenda for the next few days but i'll pl sort of plug a few of these things in um and uh but keeping at the forefront, uh, the needs of, you know, the children and uh, teachers and families at this point with COVID. That being said, I, I do think uh, everything that everybody has shared is certainly within the realm of possibility of accomplishing this year. Uh, we are um, going to, as I mentioned, spend time with finance tomorrow going through uh, the waiting study. And we have two people who served on that waiting um, task force this summer and did do incredible work. I want to echo Senator Chittenden's comments, compliments. Um, and I, I suspect the Senate will end up starting that process. I do, uh, the House is doesn't seem interested in starting that or church and state. Um, so I, I, I don't, can't force force them. So I think, um, and I'm fine with that. And really it's, it's a division of labors, particularly around waiting what would happen in finance and what would happen in this committee and what might be done together. Um, and then uh, Senator Perchick, you did mention that question uh, about um, agency of education uh, versus the state board. And there was some work done on that this past summer. Uh, and I did ask the house to start to look at that work, um, but we'll get that work as well um, at some point and make sure that those lines are um, what they should be around responsibility. Um, so yeah, that's it. Anything else? Um, I just wanted to review priorities today. And uh, of course we'll have some later afternoons, but um, this is a, I feel like a, a good first start. And then we did ask Jeff Bannon to come in next week. Uh, I 
I should have mentioned, I think all of my priorities are consistent with all of yours. The only uh, mental health, uh, the teacher debt thing that came up yesterday that Jeff Bannon's gonna come back to us and talk to us about. Um, and then uh, he's also gonna talk a little bit what Center Lions has touched on with uh, certifying people with mental health skills to get into the workforce, but also teachers, as uh, Senator Perchlick mentioned yesterday, there seems to be a bit of a disagreement out there around how fast this takes um, and are there ways, is there a role for us around streamlining or is it an AOE or is it, uh, who, whose lap is it falling um, and how can we be most helpful as, I think there are people that are looking right now who would be great teachers, but might not wanna go the traditional route and are there things that we can do to help them um, make their way into the classroom. Senator Hooker, did you have a question? I, I was just thinking about um, some of the bills that have come through with regard to uh, loan forgiveness and stuff for teachers. And yeah. I don't know those are things that we can tack on to other bills. Um, I know loan forgiveness for everybody, if we, you know, in order to increase the workforce, but yeah. I don't know how that play. Well, I'm hoping Jeff will come in with with some ideas. Uh, you know, he has his he's on the ground probably more than anyone else around teachers and their needs. So uh, it's one of the three things we asked him to come in and talk to us about next Tuesday um, is, is what might what might it look like and how might we structure this and how do we how do we address the, the teachers that really need it? I mean, like any career, you have a range of teachers with a range of backgrounds. And is there a way to get that, um, you know, in teachers that might need more financial assistance than others? You know, are, are there ways to to help those teachers out? Or do is it just a blanket policy where it's anybody who's teaching um, would, would qualify for some kind of uh, loan um, forgiveness? Yeah. And it and we know that it isn't a new concept. I mean, right. my loans were forgiven when I taught after I graduated. My brother's loans were forgiven up to 10 years after he taught, uh, when he taught special ed. I didn't know that. Okay. And, you know, mine, I was just in the regular classroom and up for five years I had my loans reduced. So. Mm -hmm. It, North, North Carolina had, had a program, and this was years and years ago, and they still have it where if you teach in a rural and more impoverished area, mm -hmm. so depending on what the me median income is, um, your, your debt is forgiven within three years or, you know, it's two or three years or a year for every year you teach, you get a mm -hmm. year of loan forgiveness. So yeah. there are a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, there really I, are. And I, I mean, I do have a bill in that's broader than this, but it, it, plays into it uh, a little bit. And that is just how can we make this the best state to teach it, you know? And right. I know that's a heavy lift and a lot of it is connected to finances, but, you know, I would love that kid who's graduating from, you know, not only UVM, but Castleton and University of Oregon and Ohio State to say, hey, this is the state that I really believe, this is where I want to have my career because, um, you know, I have the support, I have the salary, I have the debt relief. Um, all those things are in place so that this is where they, and they have the time. I mean, that's one of the other things that I feel is missing from, from you know, teaching is teachers are, as Senator Lyons mentioned, do, doing so much uh, in addition to teaching. So how can, how can we make it the environment that would um, appeal to young people and old people, you know, people my age who might want to start teaching or, um, return to it so and speaking of old people <laughs> yeah i just want to point out that there are a lot of grandparents who have kids in school who are yes. also you know doing the child care and stuff so we need to look at what we can do to help kinder care what you know so that uh we can help families in all as in all ages at all levels yeah are you talking specifically senator hooker about uh, grandparents who who have who are caring for their grandchildren yes yes and, different and circumstances you know, you know yeah you know with regard to communications yeah. from say the health department grandparents need to be included in in that as well yeah i think grandparents have taken in my opinion an increased role over the years uh particularly as drug addiction 
addiction issues have risen, uh, you know, giving, helping families start by buying their first home, helping with college, all sorts of things that grandparents are doing that um, are, uh, are pretty incredible, so. The, the organization uh, Kin as Parents that was started, I, I, the person who had a really a prominent role to play in starting it was Lynn Granger. She's no mm. longer alive, but uh, I worked with her. I knew her for many years and she worked very hard to uh, legitimize the role of uh, kin in caring for mm. kids, mostly grandparents, and especially when addiction was involved with the parents. So, really? So, yeah. Um, and there, there is a good, there is a good group out there already organized and maybe they could give us some tips. That should be great to hear from tips. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Okay, anything else? All right. Well, thanks everybody uh, again. Welcome back. Uh, hope you have a good evening and I'll look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, take care. Yep, thanks, you too.